Uh, my name is Samantha Ratnam. I'm the leader of the Victorian Greens and also the member uh, for the Northern Metropolitan Region in the Upper House of Victorian Parliament. I'm Ellen Sandal. I'm the Greens member for Melbourne and the Deputy Leader. I've been in the Victorian Parliament for just over two years and prior to that was on Moreland City Council for five years. I've been a member of the Greens for over 10 years and I didn't think I'd be a politician one day but thanks to the opportunities and the mission that we have before us I decided to get more involved and put my hand up. Uh, what really inspires me is taking action to protect our environment, to act on climate change and to tackle social justice. I never thought I'd be a politician. I grew up in the country and I always wanted to be a scientist and I moved to Melbourne to study science and so I was a scientist for a while but once I learned about climate change I realised it is going to affect everything about our lives and our lives and future generations and our environment. So I ran a climate change not-for-profit for a while, a national and international organisation before I realised that the Greens could have such a big impact on our climate change policies and social justice policies at a state level and a national level and that's when I put my hand up to run and be a politician. So I joined the Greens 10 years ago when the global conversation about climate change was really at fever pitch and so many people uh, like me were wondering what we could do to help out. So I decided to join a group of people which was the Greens because it aligned with my values and they seemed to be the ones with the most courage to speak up for climate and our environment and for people as well. Uh, then going into local government, I started to learn about the different levels of government, the different roles and responsibilities, but just how much, for example, a local community is impacted by the laws that our state parliaments make, from our natural environment to our neighbourhoods, our urban planning, to our arts and culture. So that made me really interested in getting involved in state politics because I knew that our capacity to create change was really, really uh, immense. I was running a climate change not-for-profit organisation and getting quite frustrated that even though people were speaking about the importance of climate change and raising their voices, the federal and state governments didn't seem to be that interested in doing anything to get us off coal or to get us towards renewable energy. And then I saw in 2010 when the Greens had balance of power in the federal parliament at a local level with Adam Bant and in the Senate with Christine Milne and Bob Brown we uh, formed the balance of power and so in order to support Julia Gillard's government we put some conditions on that and said you need to put in a carbon price, you need to invest in renewable energy, you need to put money into dental care for kids and I just saw how powerful that was when the Greens were successful and able to implement their policies and get real change and that's what inspired me to put up my hand to run at a state level and I wanted to run at a state level because so many of the decisions that affect our day-to-day -day lives are at a state level, how, how good our schools are, how good our police force is, how good our hospitals are, also whether we're protecting the environment, whether we have coal or renewable energy for our energy, they're all state government decisions and also how we plan our transport and we were fighting against a huge toll road at the time uh, which we were able to win that campaign through running for parliament. The most rewarding part of both running for election and then representing the seat is representing this really diverse community. So my seat is a big region all the way from the city of Melbourne all the way up past Broadmeadows and with that uh, there's a diversity of people from different cultural backgrounds, from different socio-economic backgrounds uh, and that was similar to being on council, thinking about how you could be the best representative for them but also thinking about how we can talk about having a vision and to create change at a time when people sometimes think that politics isn't really working for them. They don't know whether the politicians are actually representing their voices. So I take um, a, a lot of effort to try and represent the people that I'm standing up and speaking up for. Similarly to what Sam said, the most rewarding part is just getting to know your community and one day I might be in the morning speaking to a group of year five students about 
recycling in a primary school and then in the evening I might be going to an Oromo or an Eritrean event uh, celebrating an important uh, moment in the calendar for them. And so it's just so diverse and you get to know elements of your community that most people don't even get to see behind closed doors and they welcome you in and you're their representative and it's a real privilege to get to know so many different people. Uh, I think challenge comes with the job of being a representative, being in politics, uh, but those challenges can also be opportunities. One of my earliest experiences of being a representative uh, was, you know, talking to the community about an issue where they had a particular viewpoint and they uh, weren't quite sure whether their council or their state government was working uh, in their best interest. For example, in urban planning, they thought that decisions were made above their heads and without taking their voices into account. So as a representative, you really need to listen to how people are experiencing that and then think about how you can change it to make it better for them. So often the criticism might come at you because people think that you solely have made that decision. But what I've found is there's such an opportunity to talk to people to explain what's going on and then sit down with them to think about how do we actually find a solution to this. And that's what I found really rewarding going to state parliament because a lot of those laws are made at the state level that impact our local communities every single day. For me the biggest challenge about being in politics is that we still have these vested interests making so many of our decisions and influencing our governments. We still have political donations that can be made to the big parties that influence decisions. We still have big lobby groups whether it's the fossil fuel industry or the gambling lobby who are in the ear of our premiers and politicians and it can be really frustrating being in parliament and seeing that happen and wondering how we can change it. But we're working every day to try and change that and I think things are slowly shifting as the community sees and we can help shed a light on some of that corruption and some of that undue influence. But it can be hard going in there and working really long hours and working your guts out to go in there and see that money talks um, and rather than the community voice, which is sometimes a bit sad. The Greens have a really strong track record of ensuring that there's a diverse uh, group of voices in the people that we elect to our parliaments and having equal gender representation. In the last Victorian Parliament we had eight MPs and seven out of those eight MPs were women so we had the largest proportion of women of any party room anywhere across this country. Uh, we've never had under 50% women in our state party rooms and that's a record that we're really proud of but we work really Really hard at it and that comes from a strong empowering culture within the party as well so I think what we all have to do is to make sure that we're living those values we're role modeling it so we're working in our own parties and then when we get elected to our parliaments we're advancing the issues of women and in my experience having more women and having more diverse uh, representatives at the table changes the types of decisions you make and also changes the way we make decisions and I think we've been able to advance a lot of women's issues because we've had more women now being elected thanks to parties like the Greens. And you can just see, I mean, we've got a leadership team that's all women. Um, the Premier's a man, the opposition leader's a man, but Sam is the third party and she's a woman. We've got a female leader and we pride ourselves on having gender diversity, but also cultural diversity. We had the very first uh, Aboriginal woman ever elected to Victorian Parliament was a Green. Uh, the first Vietnamese woman, the first Tamil, uh, Tamil Sri Lankan woman. Sri Lankan right. woman. And so, you know, there's been a lot of firsts for the Greens, breaking new ground, but hopefully they're not the lasts. Hopefully we've broken the ground and other parties will follow and we'll elect more women, more diverse voices to our parliaments.
So my experience so far, and particularly taking on the leadership of a political party, has been really interesting and one thing I reflect on is how people treat you on an everyday level. For example, in the chamber, a lot of people see the type of heckling that happens in parliament, you know, most people don't like it and, you know, it's not a, the great, not a very great representation of what happens in that place, uh, but it has an impact on people and so uh, I've definitely noticed that uh, when you're different, uh, sometimes people will want to say something about it. They feel uncomfortable, they don't know how to say it, but sometimes that comes through the heckling and uh, little comments that are made here and there as people get used to it. And I think that's about breaking new ground. But I've also noticed that uh, being a woman in a position of leadership, uh, representing a community, sometimes what we see is that people want you to talk about certain issues. So they're not used to these different voices talking about issues that they might have been used to, say for example, only men politician talking about before uh, so often it's about breaking new ground there too and saying no I will have a legitimate informed opinion about this and I should be part of that debate and uh, we encounter that uh, quite often as women are now breaking more barriers and you know hopefully becoming more equally represented uh, in our parliaments. Unfortunately sexism still does exist in politics and in many other workplaces um, you know, as a younger woman, I haven't had it nearly as bad as uh, some of the older women in Parliament would have had it in the past, but it still exists. When I first went into Parliament, the level of heckling for me was so much higher than for my male colleague and the kind of things that other politicians, particularly older men, would say. So the Labor Party would send in older men to yell over every one of my speeches to try and intimidate me, and they wouldn't do that for my colleague. They would call me things like, suggest that in my former jobs I was just the pizza girl or um, you know trying to put me down things like that and I called that out in the media and and that did help actually taking it back to the bullies does help uh, but it is difficult often I'll attend events with um, we also have a Greens member for Melbourne at a federal level Adam Bant who's now our leader and I'll often attend events with him and sometimes people will come up and assume that I'm his wife that, that I wouldn't also be a politician and also being a mum in politics brings some of that to the fore as well and when I had my first child in politics which was three years ago um, there weren't that many new mums in politics and the, the system in the institution just wasn't used to it so we didn't have the kind of facilities that enabled me to bring the baby in and to make it uh, easy and comfortable for me and the parliament just didn't even know how to deal with an MP who had a baby they, they didn't even have the structures in place they don't have maternity leave they just they don't even know how to deal with it because so few women had had babies in politics but now quite a number of since I've had my daughter quite a number of women have had babies in parliament and so things are getting better we've got change room facilities we've um, the speaker and the institutions are just much more used to it now and they recognize that if you want to have a a diverse representative parliament you're going to have young mums in in politics and that that's good and that they bring a good perspective and that we need to change our behaviors and, and thoughts to accommodate that one of the reasons i think we've had so few women in politics some of the reasons are because, uh, the same reasons why we've had unequal gender representation in lots of different professions and workplaces. There's structural and systemic and historical barriers, there's prejudice, there's bias, there's expectations that people can't do the same job and so it's really been about uh, attacking those and demystifying those and that's been a long-term project and we thank uh, you know the feminist movement all those amazing activists whose shoulders we stand on it's the reason why people like me can be in positions that I am today for all that work they've done and they've paved the way uh, in politics particularly there's this very acrimonious environment so people see conflict and they see people putting each other down uh, they know about the structures in place that make it very inflexible. Uh, federal Parliament for example is spending long periods away from home. It's not a very family friendly uh, environment but that's not because it can't be. It's because we haven't created the systems that would allow more women to participate. Uh, women have been breaking down those barriers and making it for easier for women who come after them and that's one of our jobs as well. But I think you put all that together you see why 
politics particularly is uh, intimidating and it feels like women haven't been able to participate but there's every possibility that we can and we should uh, and there's so much more work that we need to do. Yes I agree with a lot of what Sam said. One of the reasons a lot of women don't want to go into politics and tell me that they don't want to go into politics is just that it's the bullying and nasty nature of it which still exists and it doesn't need to be like that, that real adversarial culture. It doesn't need to be like that. We could actually be making decisions in a much more collaborative way and we saw that we've had some, some policies come before parliament that particularly affect women like um, decriminalisation of abortion where a group of women from across parties sat down and nutted it out together and that's um, that works and it takes some of the heat and the nastiness out of politics but while we still have a lot of these older men in there who um, are perpetuating the old cultures women are going to look at that or lots of other people will look at that as well and say why would I go into that but also the family aspect of it is difficult and while women are still primary carers for their children, it doesn't make it easy to go into parliament and so we really need to address equality in parenting to make sure that, it's, that men and women are equally able to do big jobs like going into parliament. Uh, the world needs women to step up into more positions of leadership. Uh, I'm really hopeful about women, what women's leadership can do to create the type of change that we need to tackle the big problems. We're talk talking about things like climate change, which will impact all of us. We're talking about inequality that affects all of us and generations to come. Uh, and women, we've seen when they've been in positions of leadership, are able to create great change through uh, great courage but also new skills they bring to the table, a new type of approach, often more collaboration, more consensus building. So I hope that more women step up and uh, that we create the spaces that empower women to take up those positions. Research shows that women often won't apply for jobs they don't feel overqualified for, whereas men will apply for jobs that they're underqualified for. And so what I say to young women is you are good enough, you have the skills, you should go into politics, you should go into positions of leadership, because it looks like the men who are there know more than you, they don't. They absolutely don't know more than you, they're not better than you, they're not more qualified, they're just more confident. And so I encourage women to give it a go, we need you.